threat. We've had storms, we've had fire, we've had you know glass falling out of the towers. Something's different. Um, people don't like to call, think about climate change in that terms, but think about it in terms of just a, it's a changing climate. Let's not argue over why, let's figure out how we're going to manage for it. This is Don, he did a presentation here at the Calgary Chamber of Commerce and he said that uh, these payouts are the canary in the coal mine. Uh, they're very convinced that uh, this is going to be a longer term issue and it's going to get, uh, they're, they're going to have more of it. And to prove his point, <coughs> then we had the flood. So I, I'm sure, like it, the Slave Lake fire was $700 million, the claims. So I'm sure that uh, once again we'll be number one when all the claims come in for uh, the floods in uh, southern Alberta. So in my opinion, Climate change is, is a symptom of an unsustainable society. Uh, so the work we're doing at C3 is how to address the root issue and move us towards sustainability at the same time. The other thing that fits into all this, of course, is that we're now headed towards 9 billion people on the planet. So how do you move towards sustainability at the same time that your population is skyrocketing? But we can create a better future. We can have better cars, better homes, better transportation solutions, and we can have better lives. We just have to be very thoughtful about how we do it. So for us, when we're, work, we're doing our work, we're looking at two sides of the coin. We're looking at mitigation on one side, the energy efficiency stuff that we do. Uh, on the adaptation side, uh, how do we actually uh, put resiliency into our communities? How do we adapt uh, with the natural ecosystem? to what's uh, ostensibly uh, going to be a very um, changed climate. So what are we going to do? Well, if you're living in High River, <laughs> you might consider some of the adaptation measures that are being done around the world. Things like, this is off a coastline in the US for tidal surge. Uh, Holland, they have, they're developing homes that float. They float up on the piles when the flood comes through and they sit back down on their foundations afterwards. The utilities extend up into the house so you don't, your utilities don't get cut off. We were uh, helpful a little bit in getting uh, the net zero energy homes going in Alberta. Um, in fact, I had to guarantee that one of the federal ministers at the time we could actually build them. Mr. Knight, can you guarantee you can build it? I said, yes, but I can't guarantee it'll be affordable. Uh, so this was the first one. It was expensive. It was complex. You walked into the you walked into the uh, to the furnace room and you went, oh my god, it's it's like walking on the deck of Star Trek because there was pipes running everywhere and there was computer controls. This gentleman who's doing these did this home, uh, Peter Amarongan in Edmonton. I went into his latest one and it's vastly sim simplified. Uh, there's no gas in the home at all. It's electric. It's solar, and uh, so his mechanical room now is a hot water tank that's heavily insulated, two inverters on the wall, and an HRV, and that's the only thing in the mechanical room. And uh, so they, they do, they're still connected to the grid, they still use it as backup, but uh, it's, there's a number of builders now in Alberta, Habitat Studio, uh, Avalon, Jigsaw here in Calgary, Landmark. Um, these guys are pushing the edge of the envelope, so to speak, of the home. And uh, in fact, Alberta's now hotbed for net zero energy houses in North America. But we can't look at these things in isolation. The best approach to all of this is to keep looking at stuff at the systems level. If you want to create real change, you've got to do it at a systems level and integrate it because that's where you get your big, your big, uh, your big gains. This is a project that's underway in Edmonton called the Southwood Village. And what they're doing is they're taking an existing townhouse complex that was built in the 50s. They're rearranging the homes on the site and they're going to put in a gas-fired combined heat and power unit. They're going to put in borehole storage. They're going to use solar to, to uh, augment it and they're going to connect it all up in a district energy system and they're going to use a new U of A technology so when the grid goes down this thing cuts itself off and operates by itself and it becomes resiliency built into that community now because there's a refuge. If the grid went down like an ice storm in Quebec they can stay here uh, in the meantime. Part of the thing that we're fostering is called Quest, and that's uh, a, a, an effort called Quality Urban Energy Systems of Tomorrow. And this is a Canada-wide effort, 
And it's that very thing. How do we start looking at our communities at the systems level and start integrating that into something that makes our, and looking at energy, how the transportation system integrates with the heating system, with the electricity system, all of it together, the waste system, into something that maximizes the use of that energy and minimizes, maximizes the, the use of energy and uses all the inputs in the best possible way. We need to think about integrating our transportation system. This is a project that we worked on uh, with the province. This was a relatively simple program. Our, actually, on a return on investment, this is the most <laughs> successful one. And this was making the trucks more aerodynamic. It was putting auxiliary power units on it and in-cab heaters to make the trucks more efficient. But beyond that, and we haven't got to this yet because this is a really tricky one, uh, which is how do you encourage intermodal shifting? So moving from trucks to rail, what's the most efficient way to move goods? And how do you maximize that within the system? Alternative fuels. Uh, we did a project on biodiesel, a demonstration project, to prove to the truckers in Alberta that they weren't going to freeze up when they used biodiesel as a fuel. And then the feds implemented it into uh, a standard now. And so there's now standards for biodiesel and ethanol, uh, both at the provincial and federal level. But we want to move beyond that now, too, and start our discussions into uh, how do we, where, where's the right place for natural gas within the transportation system? Uh, elect, electricity, uh, electric vehicles. I had a scary introduction to this vehicle uh, two weeks ago. Um, this is a Tesla Roadster, all electric. Um, I, I, and I had heard they were fast. I had never experienced a supercar before. Uh, <laughs> I got out and sort of weeped onto the sidewalk and said, that, that's great. <laughs> got back on my bike. <laughs> but technologically, their, their sedan is now considered the best vehicle in the world. And it's approaching the same range as a gas vehicle. But the, uh, the maintenance is wheel is a lot lower, the cost to operate is much lower. It's the initial upfront cost that scares the heck out of everybody, and that's what we need to do. We need to start building these things in volume, and then the price comes down. And then we have to also make our grid smart, and we can make these vehicles smart, so they don't all come on at the same time and everybody's house browns down because everybody's vehicle just got plugged in when they got home. <laughs> but there's technology for it, and people are working on it, and we can do it. This is just an engineering issue. This is a design issue. The whole thing's a giant design issue, in, in essence. Uh, we're helping the town of high level uh, look at putting in uh, a biomass facility. Uh, they have uh, a lot of wood waste in, uh, in high level from the mill. It's the largest on mill in North America. And uh, high level wants to use it to heat and power their, all of their municipal buildings and combine them with the district, district heating system. So we're, we're helping them work through that. So because the town doesn't have that capability internally, they hired us to become their the voice for the town when they're negotiating with the engineering companies and they're negotiating with the, with the government and everybody else that inquire to get this thing up and running. With all this stuff going on, uh, we are still losing spectacularly. We went over 400 uh, parts per million uh, in May and uh, we are well on the way to surpassing the two degrees we've been all warned about. Uh, so we need to figure out um, how to wrap this up in a, in a really spectacular way. And uh, so that's the stuff that keeps me awake at night. It's, you know, okay, little projects here and demonstrations there and all that kind of stuff is great. But how do we actually take that and turn it into a large scale movement that will give business returns because this is, this is how the world works. It gives business returns, provides opportunities, new employment, provides all those things that you want in a growing economy, how do we actually make that happen? Now the scary thing is that if we don't get this under control, we don't know what's gonna happen. So um, Alan Knight, if you've met him, uh, was the uh, sustainability advisor to Richard Branson. And he said his thing was, there is no planet B. Right? It's not like we're going to say, oh, well, we wrecked this one, we'll just move to the next, the, to the next one over and we'll live there instead, because Mars isn't that hospitable. So some of the bigger brains that we have in the world, including David Keith, uh, who's now at Harvard, 
is looking at what could you do around geoengineering and should we do geoengineering as a last resort? Um, and David would tell you that uh, he's not advocating for geoengineering, he just thinks that if people are going to actually consider this, we should give it a really fulsome review before people make the wrong decision. So geoengineering, this one, is a concept for a cloud ship that would take seawater and produce cloud layer out of it. And the cloud layer would act as a reflector to reflect the incoming solar radiation and protect things like Arctic ice. The thing that's happening in the Arctic right now, all the models are wrong. Uh, it's happening way quicker than they modeled. In fact, we might have open water within the Arctic, completely open water by 2017. No ice at all in the summer. Now, that doesn't sound bad. I mean, you know, okay, so Arctic water, open water, flat open water, absorbs more than 90% of the radiation that hits it. The ice, snow-covered ice, reflects over 90% of the radiation. So when the Arctic starts absorbing huge amounts of radiation, it starts to release the methane that's locked up in the, in the ocean. It starts to release the methane hydrates in the sea. It becomes a scary deal. And, we, and you have, we have to think about this in terms of, it's not just a meter of sea rise, it's not just, you know, the weather's gonna get a little more unpredictable, it's that we might cause something that we can't fix. Now, everybody buys house insurance, everybody buys car insurance, all of this work is providing us with insurance against what might happen. It also, if we do it right, will make a better society for everybody. We've done a lot of projects over time, uh, but C3, as, a, as an organization, we're now changing our business model. Uh, we're moving to a social enterprise. We're gonna be concentrating on energy efficiency, uh, climate resiliency, offsets, and providing sustainability services to other organizations. And everything we do gets monitored, measured, and verified for its emission reductions. It's not airy-fairy. We can actually show you the calculations. We can justify all of the reductions that we claim that we have facilitated. So, I'd like to thank you for your time and interest.